Hello, fellow communicators. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here because you belong here. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Live, Stories Told, and here's what I know. Everything in our social world is created through communication. That's the stories we tell, the way we show up to each other, and the patterns we find ourselves in. And if we can take the time to understand all this, then we can start changing our communication and making better social worlds for ourselves. Today, we have part two of our conversation with John Burnham. Today, we're discussing the liberation that comes from trying on new perspectives, the painful lessons of becoming less certain but having more clarity, speaking to listen and listening to speak, and so much more. We already know that John has great ideas to share about ways to reflect and to approach others with openness, and we'll get more of that today. So get yourselves ready to do some reflecting, some learning, some growing, because you're just as much a part of this conversation as John and I are. So with that, let's begin. I'll show you an exercise that we do with um, the students and talk about embodiment. All of us have got kind of responses from people that we're working with, either clients or supervisees, that frees us, that kills our imagination. They don't intend that. Right. Something that they say just freezes us, you know, and we can't imagine. So what do you do to generate, to be able to respond to this? And say if you were, we were working together and I chose something that, that triggered me froze me or something like that like say for example if you said to me so people often choose i'm not finding this session very helpful yeah well we all have something or several things so i would ask you to just to say something like i'm not finding this very useful at all you say this to me and then Mm -hmm. i just respond and say something right then i get up and walk around the chair sit down and you just say that same thing again uh-huh. And I have to develop a different response. I can't mm. respond. Then I get up and I do this again, four, again, five times. And after a while, they start to go beyond what they do and they take some risks. You say, this is a safe place to experiment. You can be rude back. Mm, right. You could say something awful. You know, you could say something that you feel. <laughs> and then we look at those and sometimes when people say something that's not very nice, but there's something in there that they could use, you know? Yeah. Say, for example, one person responded to that by saying, well, I'm not enjoying it much either. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you wouldn't say that, but you did say, you know, I was feeling that too, that you weren't finding this useful. Mm. I was feeling that. This conversation didn't seem so useful. So she was authentic to what she was feeling, but said it in a way that it connected with what the person said, validated what they said, but joined in with that feeling. So they were in it together. And so you do this and it can be quite playful, quite fun. We had one person, a person who find it very difficult to loosen up as a therapist. And we asked them to take themselves off screen and dance, that there's nobody (laughs) watching. (laughs) Yeah. And so we did that and said, sit down when you're ready. And so she sat down and she was a little freer <laughs> in the conversation. <laughs> That's good. We did that. A really funny thing happened with this rounded chair thing. And before session, we were helping a therapist with this and she was doing the rounded chair thing. She went in to do the session. It was a mother who she found very difficult to relate to. And about 20 minutes in, the therapist got up and walked around her chair in the session. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I said, I didn't mean this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she sits down and the mother says, what's that? What are you doing? And she said, oh, we've been doing this as an exercise. That When I couldn't think of anything to say when you were saying that, if you get up and walk around the chair, it helps you to think differently. So that's why I did it. And I said, okay. And then they went on. Then about... Ten minutes or so later, the mother got up and walked around her chair. Oh my god! Talked to her daughter <laughs> and sat down and said, "This works." Oh my! <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> and that was where we put practice into theory. We this walking around the chair just gives you. I I made that as a spontaneous thing. Yeah. So we do it a lot, 
And then how do we theorize this? And Sean's reflection in action, where you do something in the moment that can change the moment. Yeah. Think about it yeah. afterwards. And that walk around the chair, it doesn't work if you just say, think of something different. Yeah. Think of something different. The walking around the chair just gives you that moment to reflect and to yeah. reposition yourself. So, yeah, pull yourself out of the moment enough yeah, to see yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. see it in a new perspective. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so kind of off of this conversation, it seems that you are, you have been practicing for a very long time, have a lot of knowledge. People are learning a lot from you, whether you're teaching or supervising or they're your clients. Um, but I wonder how you feel that you've learned from your uh, clients, your students, or um, the people you supervise. You've got some good questions, haven't you? <laughs> I'm glad um, you think so. I'm glad you said learning. Somebody said to me, um, you enjoy teaching. I said, well, no, I enjoy people learning mm. because you can teach without people learning. And that's <laughs> that's true. That's, that's true. Not so enjoyable. <laughs> I can stand up and teach all day, but if people aren't learning. Right. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a great me. distinction. Yeah. The enjoyment is to see them learn. So. What I've learned is, well, I'm sorry. It's okay. Whenever I talk about the effect the clients have had on me, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's difficult to say if I enjoyed my work. Mm. It seems difficult when you're working with people who are suffering. Right. To say that you enjoy that. I don't know what word accurately describes that enjoying isn't moved um and i think it, some things go beyond beyond linguistic language yeah and it's better represented by just how you are how you respond in that but especially working in patients you see people who are suffering quite a bit and i've learned you know that the the resoluteness of people in the face of great challenges and how they, um, people can overcome, even when you think, I'm not so sure that this is going to work out. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought that a lot, but I have thought about it at times. And one, one person who I thought wasn't going to make it, and she went from our unit to another unit, which was even more. We have a semi-secure unit, and she went to a unit that was really secure. And... When she left, we said, what do you want to take from here? And she says, I don't want to be forgotten. So a, a nurse and myself continued to visit her to show she wasn't forgotten and so on. And she got in a really bad way, and I thought, she's going to die here. Wow. And she turned around and continued to keep in touch with her and her family. And she's traveling the world now. And she's a paramedic, and she's wow. she, she won a national award for paramedic of the year. And so, working in one place for a long time, I've learned, I've had the benefit of that learning. Yeah. If you go and work somewhere for a year or two years, you see a slice. And like the graduate families, I was telling you about before, multi-family therapy, mm -hmm. where they come back and we see how they've developed. And one young person. Uh, had a YouTube channel for her singing. And then when she left our unit, and went, she uses it to tell her story about recovery. Wow. And now we use her YouTube channels in the program. Wow. Some of our PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. And there she is talking about the physical effects. Wow. What it does to your body and things like this. And so the young people are listening to her. Yeah. And the parents are listening to her. I hardly ever use the word awe. You know, I really am critical of the Americans mm. for, for, using the, for turning the word awesome into meaningless. They use it so everything's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's brilliant. I really am annoyed mm. the way they do that. But real awe. Real awe happens not so much. That's why it's awe. Yes, yes. So 
I've learned from her how to talk about, how to use her experience and so on. So we use that. The graduate families have come back and I've learned how just recently I was trying to help parents not keep looking at change in their child as the only indicators of change. To look to yourself first. Hmm. When your child says you've been calmer, they'll feel a bit more confident. When they see you being more skilled, they'll feel a bit more competent. Mm. So, and then a mother and daughter came back and said, said to the young woman, when did you decide to change? And she says, it's not like that. It doesn't happen as a revelation one day. She said, her and her mother said, it's like grains of sand. Mm. Bits and bits until the, the weight builds up and builds up by lots of little things happening. And then you all move along together. She said, it's not just a young person deciding to eat again. Mm. What a young person thinks and decides is important, but yeah. it's not the only part of this. She says, grains of sand. And so I've used that metaphor. But the main thing, one of the, is a model that we're going to write about with the person who developed it, a mother who thought of this model to understand her own experience and her daughter's. Uh -huh. We're writing that up together. Wow called Appa and Aha. And the Aha is when you're trying to make a decision on your young person eating, it's, you've got to keep them alive, then you've got to get them healthy, then happy, mm. and then achievements. But if you're looking towards the achievements and keeping them happy, mm. you might make decisions that won't keep them alive. Right. Wow. I don't like this food. I'm not happy to eat it. It's not the issue. Mm -hmm. Right now is you have to eat what you need for your yeah. body. Yeah. All of the time with, with families, the, the model that we have now is based a, a lot on what we've learned from families. Mm. I've learned not to be so certain. When I started out as a young therapist, I was pretty clear. I knew yeah. what was what. <laughs> And what people should do. Sure. I came from a family. My mother script, she knew what was what and what people should do. And I caught a bit of that. One young woman I was working with, she'd been sexually abused. And the effects on her had been tremendous about harming herself. And so mm. She often had to be restrained from harming herself. And I worked with her. There'd be a point in the session, the, the, the mantra is about the the person who abused is responsible and you're not responsible anyway. That kind of clarity, which is mm -hmm. sometimes helpful. And I think that clarity is different from certain. And I think you can be clear, helpfully clear, but don't let that slip into certain. And that slipped mm -hmm. into certain. Mm -hmm. And as I was talking, there would be a point in the conversation where she would go white and she would leave the room and she would often be going to harm myself and I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Didn't. And she asked me if I worked with people who abused, which I did. And she'd ask me certain questions and I would be clear with a certainty about blame and responsibility. Because mm -hmm. I was certain this would be helpful to her. When that happened, when the session would end like that, I would go back to my room. The nurse would take physical care and we would make another appointment. And this day, I decided not to go. I followed. Mm. And two nurses were sitting with her on the bed. And I said to her, What's, what, what is it? What is it that happens that we talk about that leads you to say this, to do this? What is it? And I was saying it just like that, I think. I said, we've got to know. What is it? And she said, I can't tell you. She said, I know. She said, you would hate me if I told you. You would hate me. And I said, I can guarantee I will not hate you. And I never say those kind of things. Yeah. I was trained not to say those. I guarantee you I will not hate you. She says, how do you know you don't know what it is? I said, I don't know what it is, but I know me. I know me. And the nurses, I said, they said, we will not hate you. We have heard lots of things. We will not. We can promise that. Mm -hmm. We can't promise we like what. You tell us, but we can promise not to hate you for it. And later on, it came out that she had abused 
Vermont as well. Wow. And, and the whole thing of this, the complexity of it, that she had participated in the sexual abuse of somebody else as well as being abused. So when we were talking about perpetrators and their responsibility, we were talking to that aspect of her experience without yeah. her. And that certainty that we had about that, mm -hmm. intending that certainty to be therapeutic for her, it was being anti-therapeutic. So that kind of experience taught me to be clear, but not slip into certainty. Mm. So those kind of things were really helpful. And there have been other people who have helped me with that as well, including colleagues who say, John, you're seeming a bit certain about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, drat. <laughs> <laughs> again, yes, John, again, it's having kind and patient colleagues. <laughs> mm, really helpful. Yeah. yeah. I've learned also that people who seem competent still need help. Mm. When people come in our unit and you see some parents who are doing okay and you neglect, you can neglect the people who seem still have got together. And when you talk to those people, they're holding themselves up. They might um, have or what something in their culture that tells them to hold it together and not yep. show you say, look, um, with medics who come in, I say, I'm going to treat you like any client. I'm not going to assume that you know, because you have the intellectual knowledge about this, that you know what to do mm. as a parent. And I'm going to treat you like a parent. And I'm more relieved about that. Others aren't. Yeah. Using the language of CMM, the goal is always to be creating better social worlds. So I'd love to know what is a better social world for you? What does that look like? And how, how do you want to get there? How do you feel like you're working towards that? Um, inadequately. <laughs> imperfectly. Mm. Sometimes it feels not hard enough. But in um, I'm not a very political person with a big P. I haven't, didn't come from that kind of family. Mm. I think in, in, I think one of the things I've devoted myself to and increasingly do is to make therapy available to people that it wasn't available to before. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, there's a practice I call relational reflexivity that I've written about mm -hmm. is helping the client to create the kind of therapy that they want to receive. Mm. So the language, the methods of working, how to make this, use my repertoire. What from my repertoire is it that they want to use? Not what I'm currently excited about. That's the broad principle. It, it happened um, first time with family that came on a Friday morning. And you could tell that the sleep was still in their eyes and, and the kids' buttons were done up on the wrong foot. <laughs> One kid was eating his breakfast bar and uh -huh. they'd been around different ages. And I said, what do, you, what, do you, what do you want to get from coming here? Which is a regular question. Mm. And they said, uh, yes, and, uh, what do you want to mumble, mumble? And their mother said, look, you all ask that. What do we want to get? How do we know what we want to get from you until we know what you can do? Tell me, what can you do? And I just managed to avoid coming back with a clever question. <laughs> yeah. And I just started to list the things I could do. Mm. I just said, well, I can do sculpting. I can do enactment. I can do circular questions. I can do reflex. I can do externalization, you know. And the mother stopped me and said, oh, no, we were externalized at the last place. <laughs> no, well, I can do internalized other interview. And I named a few things. Uh -huh. and she, What's that internalized other interview? And I said, well, it's what, if you want to get to know somebody better or feel what it's like to be in that position, 
I would interview you as that person, as if you were that person, to see how it feels to be that person and get some idea of their experience, you know? And she says, well, we've never tried that. Let's give that a go. I said, let's go for that. So that's about helping. You have to be reasonably confident and willing to go with something. But you shouldn't feel that you have to do everything that you're asked. Mm. I've been asked to do some things which I said no to. You know, So it's not you're just a puppet. Sure. The client's not your puppet and you're not their puppet. So trying to have, so now I use lots of, like in language, of linguistic examples, uh, um, a lot of therapists like to ask when change happens, when this continues, as a, as a kind of, it's going to continue. So the presumption, it will continue. Mm -hmm. Ask when, not if. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's unfair. If somebody's at the if stage, you can just push them to when. So I say, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm not sure how to begin it. The question is, when or if this change continues or this change happens, what will it be like? What will you, you know, um, be pleased about or how will you use it? So shall I begin that question with when or if? Some people begin it with if. So that's opening a, a choice for them. Yeah. My question, their beginning. And... In one session, this young woman thought for a while with her family, and she said, when? I was quite pleased. And so I went with that, and then the dad interrupted and said, you know, I think she chose that because that's what she thinks you wanted her to say. Mm. And she's a people pleaser. So I stopped and I said to her, is that... She says, well, it's a bit of both. So we invented the word with. <laughs> W-H-I-F. Yeah. So with, with that happens. <laughs> <laughs> you can make words. You shouldn't be restricted by mm. words are all made up. Uh, yeah. So let's make a word that fits your position. Mm. Like you asked me about that word, enjoyment, of what I do is not the right word. You offered meaningful, but that's not the right. I don't have a word. Maybe sometimes a word will happen, but mm. I certainly want to continue doing what I'm doing. So there's, there's something important, but I haven't found a word yet. Rewarding, mm, life-affirming, uh, all of yes. those. But that making better social worlds. The other thing I'm most recently involved in, I'm part of a, a, the Association for Family Therapy, has a diversity working parties and dividing the different aspects of social graces, gender, race, religion, class, income. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a member of the um, race group and the class group. And in that race group, we're pushing the boundaries for each of us. And one of the things we're doing, I'm in favour of role plays. We've started a series of role plays, and I was in a group one evening. I was the, the only white person. And so I volunteered to be a, a white man coming for therapy with issues of racism. His daughter was getting married mm -hmm. to a black guy, um, but she thought that the, her dad was a, a bit racist, not so sure about him. And she said, I think you've got to go to a therapist and sort yourself out. Otherwise, I'm not going to invite you to the wedding. Mm. So one of the uh, black members of the group was a therapist, uh, the other people are reflecting. I opened myself. It, it was a role play. I don't have a daughter who's not going to be invited me to the <laughs> Right. But whiteness and maleness, the personal is in any role play. And so we went on with that, and then people reflected. And if you think in CMM terms, you can think of, I put, if you, you might put something at an episode level, racism, now, I would put the same word vertically alongside an episode of racism. If you put the word racism along the side and think, how is this applicable or meaningful at these different levels? Mm -hmm. Just to understand the episode. So there's racism, and then I put the opposite along the other horizontal. So you might have racism, and then along the other side, anti-racism. Now, I think... Anti-racism is an important movement, 
but it has its limitations. It tells you what you're against. Mm. It doesn't necessarily tell you what you're for. Yeah. Anti that, if I'm anti that, what am I for? And I think people find it easier to change if they also have stopped doing that and start doing this. Yes. So in that, it's like working with a dad who physically abused his children and being helped by the social workers to amend his ways, stop doing that. And he says, I know what not to do now, but what do I do instead? I mm. was raised like that. What do I do instead? Yeah. I coined the term raceful, raceful, racist, practiced, and raceful. What do I do that's raceful? Now, I'm at the beginning stages of this, but it's kind of looking for practices that show an engagement with and connection with, willingness, commitment to doing things differently in a, a way of appreciation, willingness to understand, willingness to entertain different ways of living and things. And so I think Newcastle's monocultural, where I was born, very white, monocultural, not so much now, but pretty much, to Birmingham. And I encountered arranged marriages. What? Couldn't understand that. I was really out of my comfort, my level of understanding. And I began to, the process of arranged marriages and how they are done with couples who were raised in romantic ideas about mm. marriage, mm. Uh, but were disappointed with it. And I would say, you know, in some cultures where they have arranged marriages, there's a concentration on friendship. And love grows. It's not necessarily the first thing that you look for. Whereas in our culture, you look for falling in love. And so that would be an example of graceful practices, taking something from one culture that isn't your own and looking, how could that add to ours? Mm. Yeah. Is ours so good? Or could ours do with it? What if we were to use that? So I've said to some couples, how about if you looked at your friendship first? and do it in this way that other cultures use, to see and if a different kind of love can grow from a friendship. Do things to be nice to each other, to be kind to each other. Mm. I used that in my daughter's wedding speech. What I got from Queenie Harris, who I worked with for many years, is Indian, and she didn't. She had a love marriage. But when I talked to other people who had arranged marriages and about that, the different values that they placed on a relationship, at my daughter's wedding, I said, there's the three L's in your marriage. First L is lust, what drew you to each other. Second one is love, as you grow and develop. Third one is looking after each other. How do you look after each other, which will help to keep love going? If you don't look after each other, love and lust fade. Mm but looking after each other and the difficult times and so on, that can be important. And that's what I got from talking to other cultures about marriage and what was important. So. Most recently, Parveen Kaur, who has taken my place as uh, head of systemic training. She's an Indian woman, born and raised in this country, but still very connected, speak multiple dialects, and is engaged with her culture in a visible and interesting and informative way. And she was talking about, she doesn't talk about racism a lot, but we were in this conversation, she's Sikh, and she told me about her experiences of walking down the street and if there's a white person or white family or white group coming towards you, they would expect you to stand to one side mm. and give way to them on their street, in their country. And that was the, the message in that. And her brother, as they grew up, her brother one day decided not to. And he kept on walking and didn't step aside. And she's that caused some problems, but that's one of the things she says that racism can happen just like that. There's so many levels collapsed into that. Mm -hmm. So when she told me that, I didn't know if I did that or not. 
as a white person. But I deliberately set about noticing when I was walking who I was walking towards and deliberately standing aside, especially with the black or Asian. And I got some very interesting responses to that. Surprised. Oh, thank you. So that can happen in very small ways. Mm. But um, how about you? Oh, for my better social world? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful question. I think to answer what I'm doing to get towards a better social world before I tell you what my better social world is, is really this podcast is how I see it. Because for me, what I'm so passionate about is that I felt so empowered when I was learning about communication theories or practices. And I thought everybody deserves to know these things. I was only learning those because I decided to study it. And that's such a small percentage of people who are doing that. But don't we all deserve these skills? Because communication and relationships are something we are all always engaged in. And we take for granted that we have communication competency, that we have those skills. And I think for me, the podcast is making something people think to be very abstract, tangible. It's making something that's traditionally been reserved for the academic setting into practice. And it's transforming the language from something that's completely inaccessible for the people that want to use it in their day-to-day -day life into something that is useful and something that actually makes sense to people and resonates with them. And so I'm very passionate about communication. And so I don't know that everyone will have the same reaction that I do upon learning these skills, but I think it can only do good and improve people's relationship, the quality of their relationships and the um, effectiveness of their communication if they can understand even a fraction of the patterns that go on. So to me, a better social world involves a lot of vulnerability and authenticity and intention, mm. intentionality around those things specifically. Mm. I care about a lot of things. I care very deeply. And I think I learned, especially in my school experience, especially young people, I think it's really easy or tempting to act like you don't care about anything because that's cool. It's not cool to care about things. You know, that's a vulnerable thing to say, I, I care about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I realized, you know, I can't make anybody else care. I can't make anybody else have the same experience that I had. I'm not going to convince them. But what I can do is live into it for myself and model it and hope that that's what could make someone care to see what it could do for themselves. Mm. I love the way you use communication and not just language. Mm -hmm. So much of what you're talking about resonates with, I think, what I've been talking about. I want to express some appreciation of what you're doing. It's something that's thinking about my training and the opportunities were open to me and the resources were... Um, Great, I value them all, but I think people like yourself and what you're doing is moving things along. Maybe we'll go into a, a stage where we're, we're resource rich in a in a way, and people will have difficult making choices. Yeah. They'll never be able to watch everything, never be able to listen to everything. And uh -huh. so but nevertheless, I think we have to risk that happening. Yeah. And so I really uh, appreciate what you're doing. I like your tolerance to me. <laughs> talking too much um not at all it uh it is a fault of mine but um i've been told that as well about myself so i always appreciate a chance to listen i wrote a paper with a student to um in a tutorial she said do i talk too much i said yes and she responded yeah. with a shock. <laughs> and i said were you surprised I said that. She said, yes. I said, has anybody else? Have you asked that question to anybody else? She said, yes. I said, what do they usually say? She says, well, they usually say, no, we enjoy what you're saying. I said, oh, I enjoy what you're saying. But that wasn't the question. Uh -huh. The question was, do you talk too much? And I said, the answer, yes. <laughs> I, I said, that comes from a person who I talk too much. So I, <laughs> right. I recognize it. 
<laughs> yeah, you're and, in good company. We went on and we wrote a paper together mm. and published that about do I talk too much in the conversation? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, That's fascinating. How, both. how did you work on that? On my listening abilities, my restraint. Yeah. I think especially doing the podcast has been helpful because it's a very intentional listening space. I would say probably in my personal relationships, I struggle more to do that. I'm also someone, I, get, I just get excited by a conversation. And so if an idea is sparked in me, I want to say it. And it's hard for me to let those go or let those pass. Say, I don't yeah. have to say, yeah. you know, I'm not going to save the conversation or say the, the best thing here. I could just... um receive what the other person's saying but the podcast space definitely helps to be an intentional listener we we do a, um i don't know if you heard of the two concepts listening to speak and speaking to listen mm-hmm. we were just talking about that this morning those exact uh, words <laughs> yeah and we do that on the in the multifamily therapy yeah with the parents and we do a role play of that in front of them in fact we've done kind of me and Becky Brain, who I run the group with, we've done role plays of interactions between parents and mm. you know, parent and a child. So, and we uh-huh. recorded that so they can watch that. Have some resources, um, yeah. We do a, a, a listening to speak and a speaking to listen role play. To, and the parents say, oh, God, that's me. Uh-huh. That's me. Or, yeah. <laughs> or that's somebody else. Or, you know. And so we work on how both of them are valuable it's not one mm-hmm. good bad. yeah but uh like you say about when you get excited by an idea yeah yeah the alternative that i know that's similar but different from what you just described the speaking to listen and listening to speak is the just different versions of the listening part yeah. being listening to respond versus listening to understand yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. my daughter trained me in that <laughs> yeah and said, look, I'm coming to tell you this, not for you to tell me what to do about it. Yeah. Just coming to tell you it. So yes. relax. You don't have to fix anything. Yeah, that's don't big. Tell me your view of it. I just want to tell you. Are you ready to listen? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it is hard work, though. It absolutely is, but to me, worth it. It's it's hard work, especially with people like you and me who have so many interesting things to say. <laughs> yes, I know so much. Should, should everyone want to hear everything I have to say? No. What's your partner like then? He also studied uh, interpersonal communication. Yeah. So that's very helpful because we have a shared language. He's excited about these things too. Your talker is mm. he? He he is a good listener, and he's more restrained probably if I jump in. You know, and I, I can't let the ideas pass by. I want to say them. He's probably better at uh, listening to understand or, yeah, not listening to just to speak. We also teach double listening. Mm-hmm. You know, like Bates in hand, double description. Mm-hmm. If you have two descriptions of something, you get a richer view than if you have a singular. Yeah. And double listening, we say to the parents that when you hear anger, listen for anxiety. Right. You know, when your young person gets angry and says they hate you. Yeah, hear it differently. Imagine or listen for anxiety Mm -hmm. and attend to the anxiety. Say something, don't talk to the anger, talk to the anxiety. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. It'll be all right. We'll get through this Mm -hmm. together. I know how to do this. We we do teach them to take the expert position. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No matter how you feel, yeah. I know how to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My part is similarly really uh, good listener. And yeah. um, I think that's how um, she's taught me a lot, really has. Yeah. If I'm nasty to her, she's never nasty back. It's a good quality. It's amazing. It leads you to your own nastiness. You can't. <laughs> yeah, do some reflection. You can't escalate. Yeah. I'm nasty to you because you were nasty to me. I'm nasty to you because I was nasty. Because I was nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Stop yeah, that pattern really quick. <laughs> it's interesting about patterns. I was married before. And when we got married, I could continue the old pattern 
without Alison playing the other part. I could do both mm. parts. <laughs> yeah. And I would do something and walk out and she would be stood there. What happened there? You know, and I would realize she hadn't said mm. what I was responding to. I was responding to something that was laid down somewhere else. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Are, are yeah. you going to go and become a therapist or? Um, I don't know what my path is going to be. I haven't considered therapy as much, but especially after talking to Barbara and you and a number of others I've gotten to connect with through the CMM about therapy, I think is I've done therapy. I've really enjoyed it. And so I know how meaningful it is for me on the other end. Cause I'm absolutely a verbal processor yeah. um, and appreciate that space incredibly. Yeah. And that feels like if I'm saying my desire is to bring these concepts to people, yeah, that yeah. feels like a very obvious way to do it. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what's next for me. I'm definitely planning on returning to school to do a master's degree. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Going to school during COVID was a very strange time. So I was feeling very burnt out. I've always enjoyed school. And so I thought if I go straight in from my undergraduate degree to my master's degree, I wouldn't enjoy it. I just yeah. want it. And so I thought I need to give myself some time. So either next year, I'll go back if I feel ready for that or wait a while, but that's definitely in my future. I've mainly considered continuing to study communication Maybe being a professor is down the road for me, but that is a lot of school that I can't think about right now. But again, I feel comfortable saying if that's a little farther down the road, great. If not, that's okay too. I'll see where it all takes me. Yeah. Now, I've really enjoyed this conversation and getting to hear your have very interesting thoughts that are thought provoking for me. And these kinds of conversations are very life giving to me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. Good. Well, that is all for our conversation with John Burnham. Today, our next turn, which is what we can take away from this conversation and use in our own life this week, is going to be to bring a willingness and a desire to understand others, their cultures and patterns and ways of being. You know, in the same way that John approaches his work with the goal of uncovering what is there to be discovered and brought out, you know, rather than trying to force it to be anything, we can bring that into every part of our lives too. And of course, our bonus next turn is to share this podcast with someone in your life who could use it. Maybe it's someone who would be excited by these kinds of conversations and topics. Maybe it's someone who's struggling to create the kind of social world they want. Maybe it's someone who's lacking a safe community to learn the value of their story. Everyone belongs here, and I hope we can only keep expanding and welcoming more voices and unique stories into this space. So invite someone into this conversation. As always, I get to do this podcast with support from the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. We share the same goals of reflecting on communication, learning the power of storytelling, and working to make better social worlds. I'll link their website so you can check out all the amazing things that they have going on, too. If you enjoy this episode, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It takes two seconds to do and is super helpful for me to get more people connected to the podcast. Also, you can follow us wherever you may be listening so you never miss an episode. And of course, you are as much a part of this podcast as I am. So pretty, please email me at storieslive.storiestold at gmail.com to keep the dialogue alive. I'd love to hear your questions and ideas for the podcast and whatever stories you want to share, since this is the space for safe story sharing. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious. Thank you for being a part of this story. That's all today for me, but not for you. So keep creating those mindful moments. And until next time, I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. <laughs>